Well, welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And we're back two weeks in a row now. Although it, it'll feel like one week. We haven't even edited last week's episode. And we're already recording the next one. So this will be fun. One week is not in a row. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, hey, we're recording two weeks in a row. So that's that's an improvement at least. So, Kevin, what are we talking about today? We're, we're still in the middle of this pandemic thing. We're in the middle of a pandemic, which is so weird. It's like we're living in a movie or something. <laughs> like, people aren't outside. Other humans will kill you if you get near them. I mean, it's so weird. It, it's, but, it but literally it's very, is like a movie or something. But it's a very non-dramatic movie because nothing's happening. Nothing's actually right. Yeah. It's just it's just numbers. And, it's like and the most boring movie ever. It's so it's so bizarre. <laughs> but but um, yeah, things are starting to open up, which is which is an interesting thing. And we'll pray that 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 all goes well and and as, yeah. as pastors and churches make decisions about how to open up and when to open up we pray for many things that first of all that they would be able to open up and find ways to get people gathered again but also that we would all um maybe have some charity with each other as we honestly face different situations everywhere we are yeah i know that that our situation in you know near st louis is very different than situations for people in Wyoming. And then even this is kind of the fun thing is that Peter and I, we both live in St. Louis, but we live far enough away that the place you live actually has different rules than the place <laughs> I live. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's, it's so even, you know, even like within, I said, there's a river that separates right, us. There's actually so that means we get different us. rules. <laughs> so, so I think that the end of that is, and I've talked to several pastors about this in the last week or two is that, we really need to be patient with each other and and forgiving and mm -hmm. understanding that people are facing different circumstances and and maybe different rules, maybe different situations as far as congregations go and all those things. So in all of this, I think we pray for for opening up. We pray for that that this would end, obviously. We pray for the restoration of worship and gather around word and sacraments, but we also pray that the church would would grow together as we love each other. Um, in all of this, but I didn't really want to talk about any of that. Well, you didn't tell me what you wanted to talk about. I know, so isn't that fun? I'm just gonna so, run with it. <laughs> so here we go. John eight. Jesus says this, beginning in verse thirty one. In John chapter eight, verse thirty one, Jesus says, "If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free." Now mm. I know everyone knows that verse. If they don't, if they don't know the whole passage, they at least know the truth will set you free or something like that. As a matter yeah. of fact, the irony of ironies is these words are inscribed on the wall when you walk in the CIA. <laughs> I have a very good friend who works for the CIA, and he he got me a a tour there. I can't say his name, obviously. Um, and when you walk in the wall of the CIA, these words. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Are actually inscribed on the wall there, or at least they used to be. I haven't been yeah. there in a couple of years, but they were. Um, so, so this is obviously a very well-known passage. And okay, does this does this passage rise to the level of one of the uh, most misused passages ever? Right alongside, well, I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because I'm not sure it's it's as misused as that one, but it, it certainly has the potential. Let's say. Especially in America, where where we think freedom is is um, more essential than than breathing for life or something, you know, it's it's our <laughs> inalienable right given by our Creator. So, I mean, that's that's life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. I, I, I'm remembering. I think liberty's uh, a, in there. I'm remembering a conversation I had in a church context. Oh man, ten years ago now. At this point, I wasn't LCMS at the time, and this this verse was quoted in a congregational meeting to support the idea that whatever happened in any meetings anywhere should was supposed to have to be reported because there was a thought that things were being hidden and reporting it the the truth would set you free and so that was the whole idea behind quoting this and i remember looking it up i was like i, I think this is a bible verse about salvation and like the state of your soul and who jesus is and not minutes kept in a church meeting 
I don't know. Yeah, and and <laughs> and so you start we start riffing off the words truth and free and and we start having agendas that we use this for and everything. Yeah. But I think what's really interesting is is obviously I taught this this week, but when you teach, you don't get to say everything you were thinking sometimes, you know, especially if you're me and your brain functions at different levels at different times, it seems. Your, your so, brain moves faster than your mouth. Well, or or vice versa, or someone asks a question and it spurs different thoughts. Um, let's be honest. It's the Gospel of John. You could spend the rest of your life on one verse in the Gospel of John and still feel like you haven't gotten it all. Um, you just, Kev- Kevin, that's actually what you do. Oh yeah, that, that you just described yourself. Yeah, that so that just, is what you do, <laughs> and, and some of my good friends. So so yeah, but but as I was thinking this, I I think this verse is essential for us um, as Christians as we face not not this situation particularly, but but this situation is certainly an illustrative of what this verse would help us through. Okay. Um. So and, and actually, a really good, a really close friend of mine. Um ask a question about this so so this is kind of all been in the back of my mind as well as as far as following jesus um the balance between kind of looking at jesus as an example and becoming too militant in that or too legalistic in that and 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 also the danger of seeing jesus as just a good example instead of trusting him as savior and Mm -hmm. and kind of all that tension that gets built up then in the christian life of of yeah we want to walk as jesus walked according to first john we want to do the things that jesus did in john 14 you know verse 12 and 13 jesus even says you know you've seen me doing these works but you're going to do even greater works than these yeah and whatever you ask of the father i'll give him you know in all these passages where we really are encouraged to live lives that imitate christ and you know if you, if you read paul very long at all paul is very interested in christians living their life um, according to the will of God and, 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 and even talking about how, um, it's our, it's, it's not a choice of ours, whether or not we're going to do this. This is actually what we do is we live according to the will of God. And so, we've had several episodes on that. Right. In our, and we've in talked our podcast. about this. Yeah. But, but this is just something I want to talk about. And this might be, this might be a little bit rehearsive or a little redundant, but I, I think it's a good, it's not it's rehearsive because I don't even know what you're going for right now. See, exactly. So, so you this won't is know until not... it's too late. So. <laughs> But but listen how the conversation goes, okay? So this is Jesus talking to a bunch of, um, according to the text, Jews who had believed in him. Now, remember, mm-hmm. that's probably a phrase that means they hadn't out, out and out rejected his words yet. They didn't necessarily believe in him as Savior, as a son of God, you know, died and, and raised for the sins of the world. Not that kind of belief, but they, they hadn't walked away yet, okay? So okay. he says to them, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free great who can argue with that right <laughs> so they answered and they said we are offspring of abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone how is it you can say you will become free ah uh. and and right away we have this weird conversation because um part of the whole identification of the people of israel is that they were the ones that were set free from slavery in egypt well not I mean, only that the, but when this passage happens, they're under the subjugation of Rome. Right. So, so, so not only not historically can they say they've never <laughs> been, but but they're actually in a in a relationship right now where only it's uh, it's only under the graciousness of Rome that they're allowed to even exist in Jerusalem, <laughs> right? And worship at the temple and have these kind of things. I mean, this this comes up in the crucifixion of Jesus. Is they're not allowed to do certain things, right? Right. Rome is actually telling them, here's what you can do, here's what you can't, and yet they say to Jesus. Not only are we not enslaved now, we've never been enslaved. Which, <laughs> which this is this is a general, this is an aside, right? But just a general word of advice: the people in the Bible are not as dumb as you think they are. So okay. it's not just that they're going like we forgot our whole history. No, that's probably not what they're saying. They probably actually are understanding Jesus since he's talking about abiding in his word and discipleship. They probably are thinking some kind of spiritual enslavement or some Uh, kind of, you know, he's talking metaphorically or he's talking on a spiritual level. He's not saying you guys weren't in Egypt, you know, thousands of years ago. That wouldn't make any sense. So the conversation is probably immediately even the Jews minds. Jesus is talking about a spiritual freedom, some kind of being free, right? So the in idea a metaphysical that, sense. So the idea that even when they were in exile, 
they could still worship to a certain extent. They could still well, follow Yahweh if they chose to. And that's that's kind even of putting then? a very a very Western and New Testament feel on it. But but just Ooh. even the idea that that they were free because they were still Yahweh's people. Okay. Okay. So sure. so being the people of Yahweh is a freedom. It's it's so, a freedom and, and from even in all those other circumstances throughout yeah. their history and now they're still Yahweh's people. Still Yahweh's people. So they're as, still free as far as they way. understand it. So yeah. so that's what's really inter- interesting is they say we are offspring of Abraham, right? Which is code for. We are we are Yahweh's people, yeah, and therefore we have never been slaves to anyone. So if we're not enslaved because we belong to Yahweh, then how can you say that we you will make us free? And and this is Jesus' answer. He says, "Truly, truly." Which again, when Jesus says "truly, truly," he's saying, "All right, listen, <laughs> right? I'm listen about up. to give you some truth. This right? is really, really true. This is important. Yeah." I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And this is huge because, you know, and again, don't don't listen to pastors who say the Greek really says, but this is one of those passages where the Greek really says um, exactly what the English says, which is great. But <laughs> but it's everyone who does sin, everyone who commits sin, everyone who, who the Greek word is does, right? Who does sin. Yeah. And it's 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 not just like, you know, a flippant idea, but this is this is really kind of cutting everybody off at the knees and saying anyone who sins ever is a slave to sin. Hmm. Now he just got rid of their we're Abraham children stuff. He said, I don't care who I passed it you entirely. Are. Yeah. If if you have if you sin, you are a slave. To sin. Now, this means Jew, Gentile, Pharisee, Sadducee, layperson, priest, high priest, it don't matter. Mm. If you sin, slave to sin. You're sounding kind of like Paul now. Yeah. So we got a little exactly. bit of Romans going on here. Uh, exactly. The yeah. same move <laughs> Rome, that Paul makes in Romans 3, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are. Yep. There ain't anybody that's, that's good. No one seeks after God, not even one. And and all together are right, are evil and and turned against him. This whole this whole catena of quotes that he uses. Mm-hmm. And then he he finishes all that by saying, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? So so Romans one and two establish that Jew and Gentile alike sin, whether they sin explicitly against God's law or sin without even knowing that they're violating God's law, they're still sinning. And then Romans 3 says, everybody's in the same boat because of this sin. That's exactly right. Same thing that's going on here, yep. right? It's like they know the same truth or something. <laughs> and so this is what I want to talk about is if you commit sin, you're a slave to sin. But now listen to this. The slave does not remain in the house forever. So it's not like, well, whatever. I'll just deal with being a slave. Okay, that's my lot. No, so he's be saying, it. There's this doesn't end done. well. Being a slave does not end well, right? The son remains forever. Now, why does the son remain forever? It's because he's not a slave because the son does not sin, right? Hmm. Yeah. And it, you would think the passage would say, therefore, I'll make you sons. But it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. Listen to what it says. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now, I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father and you do what you have heard from your father. Which means not the same father. Not yeah. Good. I'm thinking not that good. I'm trying to remember we've had this conversation somewhere recently about different fathers and mm-hmm. references to different fathers here. Okay. Keep going. Okay. Now I'm not gonna go. That's that's it. Okay. <laughs> so here's the question. What does it mean to be free? See, this is the well, fundamental question. Yeah. What does it mean to be free? Well, you want to be associated with the son. Yep. That's part of it here. But 
than That's his father. Good. Jesus, Jesus's father specifically. So, so what's the opposite of freedom? Well, slavery. I think the, right. Slavery. The, the Jews are right that slavery is the opposite. That's slavery why slavery is the opposite of freedom. That's exactly right. So setting free means you are no longer a slave. A slave. Now, what's slavery? According to Jesus, what does he say? In this case, a slave to sin. Right, sinning. So sinning, yes, committing sin. Yeah. yeah. Now, now listen to this. So freedom means the ability to not sin. Not sin. Ah. Uh. Yeah, and and this is is what I think is so important for us to stop and recognize is that freedom is not the ability to either sin or not sin right right freedom is simply not sinning or since we started this off talking about americans and freedom and whatnot we often see freedom as my ability to choose whatever it is that i want to do good 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 so now you're getting back to the next question which is well if slavery is sin and freedom is not sin then what is sin well this is where we talk about sin is doing not god's will exactly (laughs) going against god's will (laughs) is not doing god's will so if you're not doing god's will whose will are you following not god's Uh, yeah not god's anybody else's so so we say as lutherans (laughs) as lutherans we would say you're following one of three wills your world The world, your flesh, and the devil. Right. One of those three, right? Those are the evils that fight against God's will. The devil, the world, and your sinful flesh. Now, original sin, which we call concupiscence, is this inbred love of sinning. It's been a long time since we've played the concupiscence game, but you you won. Good job, Kevin. That's right, because I'm concupiscent. So (laughs) so concupiscence is this, this love of sinning that I carry around inside of me. Yeah. Okay. And that love of sinning, one of the ways the scripture talks about that, especially as we see it here, is that it's it's not being free. It's actually being enslaved. I'm enslaved. Now listen to this. This is the important part. I'm enslaved to do what I want. Oh. Ouch. <laughs> That's <laughs> why I think this is so important to talk about, is that When we understand that sinning is slavery and sinning is doing what my old Adam, my concupiscence, my sinful nature wants. Living according to my will. Yes. Is that living according to my will is not freedom, but slavery. And this is the essence of the law. The law says God has a will and that will is the only acceptable will. Hmm. Any other thing you choose to do is enslaving you to a different will and that will, those desires, that slavery does not end in eternal life and dwelling in the father's house, but it ends in death away from the father's house. Yeah. And this is the problem is that we have been taught so much in our lives, in our American Lutheranism, in American Christianity, in American society, in Western Western individualism, that, that the most important thing is the freedom of the individual. Which if, if you wonder if that's actually true, if we've really been taught that strongly to take a non uh, biblical example, just look at how so much of our culture in the United States says socialism is bad. Well, why is socialism bad? Well, because I am forced to do something that I haven't chosen to do, whether it's give my resources, give my labor, give my time to pay for somebody else to have something that, they didn't work for it, but I worked for it and gave it to them. But I'm forced to do this. If I yeah. chose to do it, that's fine. 
I can, uh, then, you know, we're okay with that. But if I'm forced to do it by some other entity outside of myself and my own will, that's bad and that's evil. Right. So this is the interesting is we have, we have believed hook, line, and sinker from a political standpoint that freedom means each individual gets to choose. Hmm. Okay. And, and whether that's good or bad politically, that's for a different show. We can, yeah, we can in, discuss in that, that realm, some other that, time. Yeah. In that realm, that might be fitting. <laughs> but the problem is we've actually imported that idea of freedom into our Christian life. And we often read scripture and have discussions about free will or the freedom that I have in Christ. And what we bring in is this idea that part of freedom is my ability to choose what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So I can choose to live however I want because of my freedom in Christ. This verse actually argues against that. It says, if you ever choose sin, that's not freedom. Freedom, and let's be very clear here. Freedom is only and always doing God's will. It's, it takes us out of the equation. And I think this is the, the constant struggle we have, whether it's in our lives as Christians or reading scripture itself, is we always want to insert ourselves in there somewhere and mm -hmm. say, where do I fit in? What role do I play? What do I have to do? How do I fix this? And this is simply another example of that's the wrong way to do this. <laughs> Sticking you know, yourself I've, in there is I've the wrong way before. to do it. <laughs> I. I, I don't anymore because of this this social distancing and, and weirdness and stuff, but I used to have coffee with a really good friend of mine, and we used to always sit down, and one of the first things I would say is, this conversation will go really well if you just agree with me that I'm God. Yeah. <laughs> right? And and that's kind of the problem, is that is that not only do we want to fit in the situation, but we want to have a prominent place in all these situations. We want to be in charge. Yeah. And and I, I guarantee you that, or that even people least, listening. Or at the least have a really good say. I mean, yeah, at least yeah. give me equal time. Equal, so God, right? God, you, you, Jesus, take the wheel, right. but make me your co-pilot. <laughs> or, or go I mean, where I want you to go when you yeah, take it, right? I mean, that, that's at, cool. At least as long as follow cool my it. directions as I'm sitting so, in the back seat. <laughs> so the problem is, is that we actually do believe that it is a bad thing to always and only do God's will. We think that's somehow offensive to our humanity or somehow lessening our humanity or somehow making us. And, and so the classic retort is, well, God doesn't want robots. At and, the very and, least, it's not fun. Right. But, but it's this, <laughs> it's this predication on God that freedom of the will is necessary to our identity as humans. And, and when we say freedom of the will, what we typically mean is the ability to sin. And I'm here to tell you that that is not a biblical idea. Hmm. The ability to sin is not freedom. It is slavery. And if you don't believe me, think about heaven. Think about your life after the resurrection. You will not be able to to sin and yet you will be truly free and and this is what jesus is getting us to see in this short passage is that freedom only exists in the father's house and guess what in the father's house there ain't no sin mm. there isn't any sinning and there isn't any option to sin because in the father's house only people who without sin get to live there. So this, this, this brought up a question in my mind about a conversation from a from several years ago, but this, this actually, I think this is why it, you, we can't answer the question. Did Adam and Eve have free will? First of all, because that's, that's pre fall and everything is broken by the fall. And so how can we look back? into right. that, we, that, that event. Scripture doesn't say, so we shouldn't either. Yeah. But but the other side of it is, if we say, yes, Adam and Eve had free will when God created them good and perfect, and we just were right. clear in saying free freedom means not sinning, and mm -hmm. then they did, 
well, we've got a conflict right, right there that can't be resolved. See, see what we mean when we say freedom <laughs> is the ability to sin. And that's right. exactly the point. And they, they have, had the ability to choose sin, therefore they had free will. And that's literally how that argument is framed. Literally how it goes. That, that's that's the actual argument. So I'm not and, building a straw man here. Right. No, I, so, and that's, we've so heard So theologically, it. if people are saying you guys are building a straw man, no. That's nope. the actual argument for why Adam and Eve had free will, because they were able to choose sin. I've heard that preached from a pulpit in a Lutheran church. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so we are not making this up. And I could actually tell you the person's name, but we won't do that on the podcast. Well, I know. I, I, but, but yeah, my point is we are not making this up. This is something we have both actually heard from Lutherans and other people and, and non-Lutherans, especially non-Lutherans. We've heard a lot of this. Oh, sure. But, but most humans believe that free will means the ability to either sin or not sin. But, but listen to the words of Jesus. Sinning is slavery. Freedom comes from the son. And if a son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And the only way the son sets you free is if you abide in his word and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. See what's mm-hmm. parallel there? The truth and the son are parallel. That's because, oh, wait a minute. So what we need is somewhere where <laughs> Jesus and truth and the father's house are all in one passage again got wait, any wait. ideas is that coming up i, I wait think a it... minute <laughs> same book same jesus same are we going to john things? 13 14 14 john 14 I, I, very I knew good. it was in that really discourse close. that's yeah. right very good okay so listen now words of jesus john 14 beginning at verse one let not your hearts be troubled Believe in God, believe even in me. In my father's house, there you go, father's house. Mm -hmm. And remember, if if, if it's his father, he's the son. So now we have the son talking about his father. Are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also... Okay, now, again, that's in the Father's house, right? Mm -hmm. So, quick review. Where is he going to go? To his Father's house. It's a big, big house. With With lots and lots of rooms. Lots and lots of rooms. Yes, (laughs) where we can play football. You knew I was going to say that, Kevin. If you're going to go here, I was waiting. I was just waiting. (laughs) So, (laughs) we should use that as bump music if we were cool, but we're not, so we won't. If we had bump music, If we had bump music or even a bump. (laughs) So... So the point is, but he goes to the cross to do this. I mean, I'm not making that up. You can just flip through the pages of the gospel. The place he actually goes next is to the garden in order to be betrayed to go to the cross. That's yeah, actually this is, where he this goes. This is the night of the Last Supper as right. he's talking to his disciples so for the last time. So then when he comes time. back, he comes back from the grave, right, the empty tomb, to bring the disciples with him into the Father's house. Mm-hmm. So so this is all about the death and resurrection of Jesus, right? So then he yeah. goes on and he says, and you know the way to where I'm going, and Thomas Yay, Thomas, he'll show up again pretty soon. And he (laughs) says to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? That's fun. (laughs) We could talk about Thomas, but we'll skip that. But but listen to this. Thomas would make a good episode, podcast episode. We should probably do that. Yeah, we probably should. Jesus said to him, here we go. I am the way and the truth. Truth. There it is. Yep. And the life. No one comes to the father except through me. Right. So now all of a sudden we have once again the son who is the truth is the one who will get us to the father's house. Right? Yep. Isn't that he's fun? he's he's literally the way there. Yeah. He says it. And and he's the truth. So in ba- in John chapter 8 you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If the son sets you free you will be free indeed. And if you're in if this if you're with the son that's good because he lives in the father's house forever. So now in John 14 you have the father's house, the father of the son who is the truth. He's the mm-hmm. one who will get you into the father's house because he is the way and he's going to go prepare the way for you, which is the cross, which is the forgiveness of sins yeah okay so this is all what it means to be free freedom is to live always and only according to the will of god and 
this is the promise that Christ makes to us is that that freedom is peace. John 14, verse 27, my peace I leave with you, Mm -hmm. right? My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. That's that sinful stuff again, not as the world gives. But I give it to you in a different way, my peace, right? And, And what we see is this beautiful picture that man was created to live according to the will of God and that when we when we live according to the will of God we are not living as robots we are not living contrary to free will we're actually living in the freedom of the people that God created us to be I mean, just just think this through for a second. Okay, now go with me to Galatians. I know Peter's a Galatians guy. He likes Galatians. So we got to go to Galatians because he's not sure it's true unless we can find it in Galatians. It's the baby Romans. That's the baby Romans. It's That's right. And he taught it a lot and he likes it. So And he's got this whole chiastic thing in his head. So there, yeah, it's out, we gotta, outside. We got to try to figure all that and out I'm, And I'm using the Bible that has the chiasm marked in it right Ooh, now, fun. actually. So it's Galatians a- 5, which, which obviously you know by heart. <laughs> the whole chapter. The whole yes. chapter. You probably yes. actually do know most of it by heart. Uh, yeah, but, a large but, part of it. But Galatians 5, verse 1. You know this one. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again in a yoke of slavery. Hey, look what it says. It says that freedom <laughs> is the opposite of sinning. I told and you if we were going to get to Paul. That's right. And if you sin, you're actually in slavery. Yep. Isn't that amazing? Paul yeah. says the same thing. Now, we're going to skip ahead because we're going to go to the place where you, that you know. Let's go to verse 16. And now we're going to talk about how to live in this freedom, right? Mm-hmm. Verse 16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then he lists all these awful things the flesh wants. Right? Gonna say, just, are you going to make me read those? It's horrendous. Yes, I don't like right? that. We, we, this is a family show. We're not going to read those things, right? And I'm pretty sure I've done half of them today yeah, and, already. And that's, and that's the problem is not only is yeah. it an icky list, but I'm guilty. So we'll just skip Except all for that. sorcery. I don't think I'd, oh, I might, I might have wished somebody good luck. Yeah. So maybe I did, did that one too. So, yeah. but, but listen to this. Now, now this, is, this is so cool. I want you guys to see this. This is great because you all know these verses. Verse 22 and 23. Go ahead, Peter. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Okay, see how it goes? Did you hear that? This is this is the coolest little phrase that I could not figure out for probably 10 years. And I, I thought this through <laughs> my head for 10 years. Why does he say after the fruit of the spirit, against such things there is no law? Oh. Usually when I hear that and when uh-huh. I've heard it taught in different places, it's, well, the government isn't going to tell you not to love other people. The government yeah, that's not isn't what he's going talking to tell about at all. you not to have be peace. But that's that's usually what I hear. Right, but that's but not what Paul's humans, saying at all. Humans don't make laws against these things when it See, comes now to listen to this. interaction this, with each other. This is where you got to keep thinking, right? Why did God give us the law? To show us his will. Why would he do that? Uh, we weren't living according to it. Because we broke it. <laughs> yeah. Right? The law is given because of sin. Oh, wait, Paul says that. So (laughs) when Paul says against such things, there is no law, that's because these things are freedom. The fruit of the spirit is freedom. The works of the flesh are slavery. That's why against the fruit of the spirit there is no law because god would not set a law against these things these are the things that he would encourage us to live in because this is being free if you want to be in could you say they're the fulfillment of the law would that be accurate no christ is the fulfillment of the law ah okay but these things see i just put myself right in there by saying if i can do this yeah look how easy that is but look what he says he doesn't say 
he doesn't say, you know, these things are outside the law. He says, no, against these things, there is no law because these are freedom. Go back to verse one of the chapter. Because these are God's will. This is freedom to live according to the will of God, which is the fruit of the spirit in you. What's Mm. God's will for you? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things, there's no law. Mm. This is freedom. Walk by the spirit. Romans chapter six, don't you know, don't you know that in your baptize, in your baptism, you, you put to death the, the misdeeds of the body? So why would you live in them anymore? See, that's not, what it's sh- not What should freedom. we say? So we continue in sin right. that grace may abound? No. That's nuts. That's insane. Who would say that? You're a crazy person. Right. So, so again, what I, what I wanted to bring out in this passage in John chapter eight is this, this beautiful discussion about freedom the sun sets you free and you'll be free indeed. It there there's so much to it that we didn't get to, but but just this concept that that as Christians, part of our faith is learning to believe that God's will is freedom. That so, being able to sin is slavery and that that what we desire is to only and always live according to the will of God. So we run to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, and it says, My dear children, I write these things to you. That you may not sin. Yeah, so that but you may not you sin. Do. He's not being mean. He's actually giving them a blessing. Hmm. See, we read that as like, oh, oh, I had so many good plans this weekend. <laughs> but now John wrote this to me, so I won't sin. Now what am I going to do? No, 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 no. <laughs> No, there that's my not the fun. way to read it. Right, that goes your fun. No, what John is saying is, I'm blessing you. This is good news that you don't sin. And then, of course, he continues because he knows his children. So he says, but if you does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who is the propitiation for our sin. So mm-hmm. here's the thing, people. This is the good news of Christ is that you are free from sinning. You have been set free from sinning. You get to live according to the good and gracious will of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you mess up, Jesus is your Savior. Hmm. Every yeah. day before the Father, advocate for you because of his death and resurrection. He is standing before the Father's throne as the sacrifice for sins, as the propitiation, as vicarious atonement. He is always interceding for you before the Father, which means your sins are forgiven. You are free. You have a place in the Father's house. Why? Because the Son who lives there forever is not ashamed to call you brother. Right? Hmm. It's in the book of Hebrews. He's yep. not ashamed to call yep. you brother. And so you have a place in the Father's house because your sins are forgiven. And that is the crucial conversation. Um, Kevin, any what do we have anything we need to tell anybody? No. If you guys got questions, you want to know more about this or about us, questions at crucialproductions.org. Questions about any episode we've had, uh, or go to the website and click the ask a question button at the top crucialproductions.org is our website i think that's all we got for you guys thanks for hanging out with us tonight see ya